Foreman today with Rick Foreman, Foreman Winery. And to get to this place, you have to know how to get here. You can't get here without some instructions or a map because it is too difficult. But Rick's a very interesting winemaker, one of the premier winemakers in the valley. Up here on the mountain, he makes beautifully styled California wines, but they're a lot like Burgundy, I mean a lot like Bordeaux wines. Uh, Rick, tell us how you get up here. How did I get up here or how do you get up here? Yeah, we know how you get up here. Actually, I don't, I don't think I want to tell how you get up here because we like the way that it's private. It is in fact, private. We're, we're reviewing our website. It's about to come up and I think it's going to be finally updated after, oh, I think the last time we had a round of it was 1991. But, and I asked Margaret this morning. Margaret is the gal that helps me uh, run the whole business end of, of sales in the, in the winery. And, and uh, I said, gee, Margaret, on the website, aren't you going to put a map? She said, are you kidding? Do you, do you want everybody showing up at your door? Yeah. Of course you're not going to put a map on the website. Uh, we like it the way it is. And then she's right because, you know, my wife and I live here. Uh, and so it's our private home. Oh, it's so but, beautiful. But it's, it is a unique property that I found. Gosh, you met my son, Toby, who works with me now. He's 36. I found the property when he was one year old. He was on my back. I was hiking through the creek bed, and I had been told that there was some property up here by a, uh, a very good friend and realtor, and so we went hiking, he, he on my back, and, and lo and behold, we came out of, the, out of the woods from this sort of dry creek bed, which we're actually sitting on top of right now. Uh, and uh, I looked around and, you know, of course there was trees, there were trees and brush, but in and amongst the trees and brush were these little grape sticks. In fact, there's one on, on the wall. You mm -hmm. see that little one beside the uh, mirror there? Mm -hmm. And I looked and I thought, my God, this thing had been planted at some time. But the more, most miraculous part about it was that I could see enough of the grape sticks that were still here to determine that it was planted on a five by five spacing. Now that's, that's very telling because, of course, this was probably abandoned around Prohibition, this vineyard. And it, the Napa Valley, the closest spacing I'd ever seen on very good soil was eight by eight, meaning that, of course, in those days, there was no irrigation, no, no drip irrigation. No dry water. farm. Yeah, it was all dry farm, of course. And so, <clears throat> you know, you put, a, you put a vine in the ground and it had to survive. And Were those Cabernet grapes? It doesn't make any difference. Yeah. What are the roots? Rootstock. Well, yeah. basically, St. George rootstock. So you put it in the ground and, and you know you put it in early in the spring and it had to just grow and survive. Eight by eight was about the closest you could space it and have it survive. So when I saw five by five here, it told me that there must be some very unusual soil structure that must, must be deep and well-drained because it's deep in the valley, but it, it gets waterlogged in the winter. When it's deep and well-drained, i.e. in the gravel, then you know it's really something. And so I found out that it was for sale. So before I bought it, I wanted to really check it out. I went, I was, at Sterling at the time. Um, this was 1977, 78. And uh, so I borrowed a backhoe from Sterling, came up, and we dug as deep as we as the backhoe could go, and it just never ended gravel. And I thought, oh my God, I've never seen anything like this. A deep gravel vineyard in the hills, uh, surrounded by this massive pink uh, uh, volcanic boulder. So I, I knew instantly this had some tremendous value. And you could see some old vines and the trunks were, you know, just this big around. And um, so I, I bought it and, uh, wow, <laughs> went after it. Well, you, you trained in France, didn't you? No, well, no, I, was, I, was, I went to Davis, UC Davis, got an a undergraduate and graduate degree in food science specializing in viticulture and enology. And I was there, you know, <laughs> I'm old. I was there in these ripe old days of, of the beginning and with all the great professors, Dr. Amberman and Cook, Webb and, and uh, Diamond and, and uh, you know there were only five in my class, so it was a, it was an ideal opportunity and um, so when I graduated I was very lucky because there weren't there there was the just the spawning of the industry the new industry in the Napa Valley the the, the the new modern age was about to happen and so there weren't a lot of wineries but there were some new wineries and there were not a lot of winemakers so I was lucky to be at that same place at the same time that place at the same time as all this was going on and I was asked upon graduation to be the winemaker at Fremark Abbey uh, Robert Mondavi or Newton which was or, or rather Sterling which had not been created yet so I thought wow this is pretty good I'm glad I went to school <laughs> and uh, you know fearless as I was I, 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 I had worked at Stony Hill during the harvest in 67 I had worked at Robert Mondavi in 68 while I was still in school at the Harvest. 
And then upon graduation, as I said, I had these choices, and I, I thought, well, I love Mondavi, they're really nice, they're great people, but I know I'll never really be one of, one of the only, or there will be many. Free Market Abbey the same way, they always had sort of a staff there, and I would just be an underling, so I thought, well, Sterling, this is a great opportunity. If they trust me, I have no fear, of course, no one does at 25. Uh, they didn't know what they were doing, and neither did I, so away we went. But um, I had a lot of technical background, and then the first thing they did was send me to France. And so I, I was just, my eyes just wide open. I'd never been out of California, let alone to Europe. And having a, a very serious chemistry technical background, um, the, the knowledge and, and observation of, of tradition uh, in, in, the, in the way that only the French seemed to have had at that time, I was just utterly astounded and, and fell in love with it. opportunity to work in a few places briefly to learn some of the things. Christian Muex of, of, of um, no, the famous Muex family, yeah, yeah, Pat Pitt, and yeah. many others, allowed me to, to uh, kind of semi-work in some of the cellars with the people and kind of observe how, how the racking went on. Do you have similar styles in terms of the way you make wines? Well, I, because I was so utterly astounded with the tradition, I came back saying, and I was lucky, saying this is what I want to do, and I was lucky Peter Newton, who owns Sterling, said, Rick, I want, you know, I'd love you to do whatever you want. Well, you know, I want you to be creative and we've got all the money and you need. Just, just bring back the ideas and what equipment you want and go for it. So I had, wow, this is great. Um, and so, you know, I, I, I brought back uh, barrels, which uh, were very rare in California at the time. I decided that we ferment Chardonnay in barrels, which practically no one did. Everybody thought I was crazy. You know, oh, you make the, he makes a terrific Chardonnay. These are the best Chardonnays you can get in California. In yeah, I, I created that style literally then. Uh, and Dick Graff was a good friend. Dick Graff, the founder of Shalom. Uh, and he wanted to build an equipment company, a, a small winery equipment company, aside from the sh development of Shalom, which at that point was like 10 barrels of wine. So we went to Europe together and brought these barrels back and brought back the notion of barrel fermentation and Chardonnay. Where'd they come from, those barrels? What, they they were Sarug. Sarug. They... No, no, let me, let me I fortunately under, understood that Limousin barrels were used for cognac, not wine. Yeah. And so many people made that mistake in the beginning, which I feel really sorry for. But, um, no, uh, Francais, Allier, uh, center of France were Nevers, perhaps, but the Burgundy barrels. So we, we, we fermented Chardonnay in barrels. And, you know, right away I realized that the French had, um, had something there. Uh, and I, I went along with the notion of fermenting in barrels, whole cluster pressing, surlies aging, but no mallow. No mallow, of course, is a primary, uh, a, a primary adjunct to the flavor of, of burgundy. And they can do it because the grapes are so incredibly high in acid at the start of fermentation that if they didn't, the wine would not be balanced. And I knew that I was working here at Sterling in northern Napa and that the, the heat was too much for Chardonnay to, to sustain mallow, which decreases the acidity. So I said, okay, I'm going to make Chardonnay the way they make it in Burgundy. Whole cluster pressing, fermentation in barrels, uh, surlies aging, but I'm going to inhibit mallow. So it's very easy to do with very low sulfur dioxide. It's very sensitive. And so I created this style. It was kind of a very Burgundian style, but it had minerality. It didn't have that rich butteriness that Mallow gives, but I didn't care. I really wanted the minerality. That's what we love about, about the wine. Yeah, and, 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 and it, to this day, I, I still, uh, 46 years later, 46 vintages later, I'm still adhering to it. And all of a sudden, you're seeing this trend to want to go there. Of course, as soon as we did, and a few others, Mondavi, and a few others started fermenting Chardonnay in barrels, everybody did. And they got very carried away. They used too many new barrels, they, they picked grapes way too ripe. Uh, ultimately, some sugar was left in the wine, and the full mallow made these wines absolutely cloyingly, uh, to me, almost undrinkable. I, I, I'm not yeah. very fond of, of that style. That's not to say that it's a bad style. Many people love it. Uh, but I, I, I just hung yeah. in there and hung in there without it. Rick's style is um, very much a Burgundian style uh, white wine, and uh, we have it in our cellar. We've kept it. We've, we've had some of their wine in our cellar for. 10 or 12 years, I know they're not supposed to last that long. You know, I, well, I'm I, telling I, you, they do. I it's recently amazing. looked at the 88, it's, it's the same color as the wine we have on the counter there in 2010, and it's just, 
it's developed that amazing sort of creme brulee yeah, hazel character and it has that wonderful minerality to it. They do age. They really do. I know. I know they do. There's it's a amazing. few others around in the Napa Valley that do, but very few. Stony Hill being one of them. Yeah. Uh, Stony Hill um, wines age. Um, and you build your wine, uh, your red wine, in, this, in the same well, way. Well, and the red is, of course, my real passion. I, I do enjoy making Chardonnay, and I, I've adhered to this style, and, and, and it's, it's sought after in, in minimal way, I should say, but definitely sought after all over the, over the entire world. The Germans love it. I, the only place I've found it in a restaurant is in Hawaii. That's it's rare to find it in a restaurant. Yeah, I, 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 it's too bad that it isn't in more places, but I don't have an awful lot. I only make a thousand cases of it, so you know, to sell a thousand cases around the world is not very much. No, not. But the Cabernet and the vari related varieties, the Cabernet blend, which is always Cabernet Merlot, Cabernet Franc, and Petit Verdot, is my real passion. I mean, that's where I spend a great deal of time. Mm -hmm. and enormous innovation both in the vineyard and in the winery and have over the years developed and continue to, to experiment and refine uh, this, I hope people think, very elegant uh, rendition of, of, of the Cabernet style wine within the Napa Valley. It is elegant and uh, we've had his wines for years in our cellar and um, they, uh, they age beautifully. Uh, it's difficult to get his wines. Uh, and this is a man who uh, who builds his wines and, and works in the vineyard himself, does it from start to finish. It's amazing, really. Well, thank you. I, yeah, I, I do. I don't have a, a, a staff. I have no one in the cellar. Uh, I don't have a winemaker or a, an assistant or a cellar crew, just me. But my son works with me. He's very, very good at construction, as you've seen, and so he's building constantly. Toby's amazing. He has his own label or his own Yeah, well, yeah, yeah, he makes wine here as well. I want to taste Toby's wines while we're here. It's we quite, quite good. And, uh, Does he go look like you do? More or less, yeah. He, he has a little property up on top of Powell Mountain, so they're a different, you know, different climate altogether and different soil types, so they, they, they are not like the former wines in that respect. But, you know, of course, they're made here, and I'm glad to be through. He's a talented young guy. Yeah, he is. Toby's amazing. Toby, Toby's goat is, is phenomenal, what he can visualize and then actually fabricate. He, he gets it, has a sense of design, and then he can take that and, and build it out of wood, concrete, or metal. I think it's great that you guys work together. We have a lot of fun. He has been a fine steward of this property. Um, he has brought it to a whole different level, really. He's, he's created some patience for me, which I've never been noted for. Helps me in the vineyard, you know, sort of be patient, waiting for ripe, ripeness and so forth, and, and maintaining uh, high quality in the winery. And then I have two very, very great uh, guys in the vineyard who, of course, do most of the manual labor next mm -hmm. to the vineyard. So yeah. it's a small staff. And then I have Margaret who helps me on the sales. And so it's a, 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 a tiny team of very dedicated people. Yeah, Margaret does a super job. She, she does. And Toby's a real nice guy. 